So now we've heard from uh, kind of the detailed level from Marcus about um, the possibilities of creating a data economy on ocean with um, this idea of uh, substrate, creating composite assets, um, and these different things you can do. And also um, heard from uh, Michael Zargum about the concept of attribution networks, kind of the high level version of the um, detailed specific version of kind of doing these things we heard from Marcus. So now um, we're gonna talk about a specific use case of the art economy that can be conceptualized as a data economy and provide some lessons and foundations as an analogy for building these like new economic forms. So I'll let each of my panelists uh, introduce themselves. <laughs> Oops. Um, hi, um, my name is Fanny Lakubai. Um, I've consulted for um, a few art and blockchain projects. I come from the art market, uh, more traditionally, and uh, and now I'm partner. Uh, we're organizing uh, digital art fairs. They're physical art fairs, but they're only focused on uh, digital art and new media, and so blockchain, VR, AR. Um, immersive experiences, you name it, we have it. Uh, next one is in Miami, so come to Miami in three weeks. Hi, I'm Stina Gustafsson. Uh, I'm a creative consultant and a curator, and I'm currently leading the art initiative for Blockchain Foundation Department of Decentralization. Um, together with Fanny and uh, Maria Pula, we br I wrote a uh, paper on block the current situation of blockchain in art, which Beth has there. Um, and yeah, uh, Department of Decentralization is doing research into the specific in intersection, looking at how we can build a more sustainable um, ecosystem for, for the very niche market. Hi, I'm Maria Paula Fernandez. I, I work uh, primarily at Golem, but I'm also the founder and a managing director of the Department of Decentralization, with what's actually a real entity here in Berlin. And uh, yeah, we are focusing basically on pushing open source and most specifically decentralized open source and doing research on various disciplines that generally, uh, you know, project focused foundations don't really, you know, don't really have the time or resources. Cool, so I'll start with um, a definition that y'all have in your paper of the art market, because I think you know, if we're talking about economies, then if you think about an economy as a network of markets, maybe controversial um, way of thinking about it, but um, you know, to make sure that we all have you know, the terms in place. So y'all defined art market as formed by a primary and secondary market, the marketplace where buyers and sellers trade in artworks, services, and assets associated with the arts. So can you talk a little bit about um, what, you know, how this marketplace is part of the greater art economy and kind of the role that assets play in it in general and then um, maybe specifically go into how blockchain impacts that? Um, I can start with the background maybe. Um, I think there's... Uh, traditionally, you talk about two things. You talk about the art world. Um, that's really the world of the creation and the creativity more than the creation even, where you have the artists, uh, you have the independent curators uh, who really uh, do a lot of research and uh, set up exhibitions uh, and institutions as well, like museums, uh, where most of the time, like, art world is like the non-financial, non-like, um, transactional um, side of the market. And, um, like, you know, traditionally, it includes most of the, like, ironically, it includes most of the uh, participants uh, to uh, these art markets or, you know, art parts that we, um, but then you have, they're, they're, they've been slowly um, estranged from um, the transactional aspect uh, where the artist still, um, you know, um, interact with their gallerist um, for the first sale, but then everything else happened without them. And having worked for auction houses or, you know, like online marketplaces, like it's the same, like I, I could have sold vacuum cleaners, you know, it was like never interacted with an artist and it was an expensive vacuum cleaner, cleaner but it's the same. I mean, and, um, and so the artists, I think blockchain, like one of the role 
um, that I'll let other people explain. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, just to not take too much time, um, is, is trying to, uh, I think, put these people back into um, the center of the market. And I think as well, talking about the art market, it's uh, it's a very traditional and very heavy market as well. It's extremely old, so it's not it's not easy to change. There's not a lot of willingness to actually change it. And I think what's really exciting when you're looking at technology such as blockchain, there's an opportunity to actually do change within this very heavy market without actually going in and potentially change laws in, in countries, etc. cetera. Um, for example, if you're looking at secondary sales, there is in very few countries have within their laws that, you know, if there is a secondary sale on the market, the artist will actually get something. Australia has it, it's in their law. For this to change, if you do it without blockchain or smart contracts, you actually need to go in and change laws within countries. And we can just, you know, imagine how long that will take, whereas applications like this will actually allow for a quicker change that doesn't have to involve God knows how many people, or governments, or foundations and organizations. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit more of a realist perspective in terms of blockchain. So uh, even though the, the art market is very, very opaque, and there's countless things that uh, they could change, and that could also actually improve either with blockchain or with, you know, or merely with the transactions, it would be really helpful because there's a lot of money laundering as well. It's very easy to attribute to blockchain the solution to everything. And it's very easy as well for uh, uninformed people to fall into this. And in the art market, of course, most of the people are not technical experts. So um, in that sense, I would like to highlight that uh, the same lack of education that sometimes in the uh, in the traditional art markets drives uh, artists to not be attributed on a second sale or a, a other unfair behavior can actually happen in the blockchain. It doesn't offer an insurance of any kind if you don't have the proper education. So. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that role of, um, you know, ownership, but also this um, kind of governance aspects that come into play um, when you're kind of situating these markets on the blockchain and how, uh, I guess, the role that blockchain and specifically uh, tools like NFTs um, kind of construct into solving some of these problems? Maybe, I, yeah, I think uh, one, uh, one big distinction that... Um, you have to do is is also like what type of art are we talking about? Because um, there are like uh, companies that are doing solutions to um, to for physical artworks, you know, like the Mona Lisa or like other uh, artworks that have existed forever. Um, and I think we should not talk about like too much these ones because um, it's already it's a small market, um, you know, like the traditional art market, and it's also um, you know, blockchain is, you know, MP said, like, you, it doesn't change um, or, like, it doesn't solve everything. And um, there was this case where um, this um, blockchain-based registry uh, of art, that was the main use case for physical artworks. It's like a registry where you can uh, uh, store provenance, authenticity, and that you would have the transparency of the blockchain for the public record uh, to verify this information. But someone said, like, oh, well, let me enter, like, the Mona Lisa and say I'm the owner uh, and the creator of the Mona Lisa. And now on the blockchain, forever and ever, this guy is uh, the creator of the Mona Lisa. So, shit in, shit out. Um, doesn't solve anything. So, uh, however, when we talk about living artists and um, uh, contemporary artists and, and mostly digital artists, um, well, all this information that we will talk more, all this data that we'll talk more about uh, can be embedded in the artwork itself. So for the first time, we're on the same level uh, for the artwork, for um, the money that like uh, is used to the, for the transaction and the recipient. Uh, so um, yeah, this is opening a lot of opportunities. And I think it's also, this is this is very much to do with NFT as well, but if you're looking at, for example, digital art, whereas there's been 
kind of a struggle within the art market because of the lack of physicality and there's been the lack of actually being able to touch on something, what do you actually own? Um, NFTs and marking it in that way actually solves some could potentially solve some of the problems as well if it's blockchain or you know anything like that but it kind of gives a slight more physical touch to it even though it's not but it's just this cert certificate saying that yeah it's a certificate saying that this is what you own rather than just having a file um, which you can't really touch upon. I think what uh, what's actually very very interesting about NFTs uh, and that has been first on, on its kind on the blockchain is actually the concept of uh, uh, of scarcity, and this is very very attractive. It, it, both to collectors and to obviously blockchain people. Look what happened with crypto kitties. I don't have to, <laughs> I think I don't have to <laughs> explain anything, but the concept of digital scarcity that actually the NFCs bring to the table is the most interesting part about them. It's not about authenticity. Actually, if it's hard coded in the smart contract, that's sorted. But the fact that no one else can own it, uh, that sparks the collector part. And of course, you know, I am personally not a collector, but the people that are collectors, uh, this is the real value where uh, you know the, the NFTs find their, their specialty. Also, there's another thing about NFTs, and it's that uh, you know there is a way of enabling interoperability uh, between them. So this is uh, this is actually a token that is not only uh, scarce and unique, but it's also interoperable. So you can really just imagine uh, you know an entire world out of these, and this is what makes them very very excited. Combined with the art world, and then you have so many possibilities that you know we could be here forever. I don't think we've uh, we've really um, you know we touched upon the possibilities of NFTs, but we've like scratched the surface. Like there's so yeah. much uh, you can actually do and um, embed. Yeah. So tying that into the talk that we just saw, um, what do y'all think about NFTs' role in an attribution network? So you know if you think of the art economy as being an attribution network in kind of these two different ways. Number one, where you know value flows through ownership and um, ownership does you know defined as access control where you know peop, uh, if you are owning something then um, you know the I guess you're able to determine the value you're able to um, you know determine what happens to it you're able to um, you know add it to a collection and have it be part of this collection which also you know determines its value and like its you know relationship to other things etc so um, but then there's also the attribution network concept of um, you know how important reputation is in the art world in terms of um, you know if something is attributed to you whether uh, you know whether an idea or being part of a collection or you know having a certain amount of value flowing to something that you owned or created like you know that adds to the second layer of you know who you are in the network and how valuable things that you have control over are so you know I think NFTs are a very important component of that network as are some of these other concepts we talked about so yeah if y'all are down to share any thoughts on that um, so uh, first of all I think that actually the, the the topic and the work on data ownership is very humanizing where you know before uh, we saw Facebook convert us into batches of uh, you know generic data, the fact that now we are you know uh, subdividing the data, tokenizing the data, whether it's, it's an NFT or whether it's a data set that's governed by you know uh, by a token or whatever, you know I think it's very very humanizing. You know, if we were like uh, I like to like put abstract uh, to you know make things a little bit abstract so if i'm going to if i'm going to think of an artwork in an abstract and technological way i'm going to think of it as a combination of data sets what, uh, the data sets can be from uh, as michael said uh, from a song the artist wrote uh, or a feeling he had while constructing the date uh, the, the artwork the artwork to the uh, actually the you know different dots in the physical artwork for example and then you, of course the certificate of ownership and and provenance, all of those are uh, actually data sets that can be, you know, tokenized and that can be owned by the artist himself. If, like, granted, you know, he receives a proper education and he's aware of his rights. 
So I think that it's that's incredibly important in, uh, and the attribution networks play a really, really important part on this. So uh, yeah, we should think uh, as well that you know the, all this work uh, looks a little bit abstract, but in, uh, it's not abstract at all. Actually, it's very, very humanizing. I think also um, thinking about attribution networks as well from kind of describing the art world is also really, really interesting because I think it's the kind of general feeling is that it's, it's quite a simple, simple thing where it's an artist and you know the artist is the creative and that's that's kind of it. Whereas if you have something like an attribution network that, that puts everyone into it, I think they would add so many more uh, humans, so many more people, so, so many more roles we're talking yeah, curators, of course, but, you know, technicians, administrators, a bunch of people who might not be accounted for when you're talking about the art market. So I think attribution networks is definitely something that is highly valuable for the art market. Yeah, so I think just to add uh, one, uh, one note, not that positive uh, on my side, I'm going to be the Debbie Downer, but um, I... I still agree that like attribution networks actually is a, um, I mean, as a use case, the art market is a perfect fit. I mean, it's like, it's all very defined. You already have all these categories. Like it hasn't changed from like traditional to digital art. Like there's still all the same people, all the same like influences and um, like value like networks that like, um, that matter uh, for uh, valuing an artwork. However, I think there's, that's where um, you know, we went a little too, fa too fast um, at the beginning, I think, with, uh, we said, great, we have NFTs, this is the first time in history we can um, actually um, uh, give scarcity, do limited edition of digital art without having a JPEG being thrown around like on social media and everywhere. Um, so now we, can, we have a market. So that was like the summary that I, I really... Like we have to be careful about like that summary being like, oh, we have the technology, so we have a market. Um, because I think on top of all of that, I think it's really important to define of this element because they are gonna be like all these attribution networks, they're gonna be part of like what makes the value in the future. However, we also have to remember there is no market yet. Um, it's even in the crypto space, like when you talk to people, they're like, oh, it's interesting, like, right? Um, but they don't own an NFT or they don't follow artists or they don't collect uh, digital art. So I think there's a lot, and you talked about the artist education. I mean, it's the education of like the, all the parts of the market, the collectors, like the, the, the technologists, like the artists, like all the parts. And I think we have to just be careful not to get you know, how do you say in English, like put the, <laughs> the carriage before the horse? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that flows really nicely into something that we have all talked about a lot, which is, you know, a major issue kind of facing the art space or the new art economy is, um, you know, how to actually pay artists and have novel funding structures. And I think this idea of, you know, not that many people are buying NFTs uh, combined with this idea of there's actually a lot more... Um, you know, like types of things that could be monetized or could be sources of funding or other sources of power. Um, you know, if we move from just thinking about, you know, one type of asset itself existing in the art market, you know, the actual piece of work, and instead think of, you know, the roles people play, like, you know, all the different types of capital, you know, social capital, labor capital, you know, reputation, these different things as also, you know, being assets and being able to be defined as assets and then kind of moving around in a market through attribution and, you know, that movement being tracked, but also, you know, kind of ways of uh, tracking and, um, like, understanding like the subjective data like is there any thoughts that you guys have about um you know not like I'm not trying to say like oh mo monetize people's reputation monetize you know all of these different things that you know the whole reason that they exist and are effective is that you know they are affective and subjective but instead you know do you have any thoughts on how um kind of the possibilities enabled with blockchain and you know DAOs for example might be able to create new funding mechanisms um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, like I think Trojan DAO uh, was mentioned and it's one 
of your use case. Um, but yeah, James was a part of, um, uh, who, is, who founded the Trojan DAO, was part of the exhibition that uh, we curated for uh, East Berlin uh, twice this summer. And, uh, and it's a very interesting uh, use case and story on how, um, can I summarize quickly what the project is? Um, so it's a, it's a group of artists uh, who were in Greece uh, after the financial crisis and they quickly realized that um, you know, the, the government would not help like a group of artists. I mean, the government could not even, you know, like stay like there. So, and, and there've been museums closed, like, um, so they quickly realized they had to uh, do some things themselves and organize themselves um, to fund uh, art projects. And um, that's how they started uh, to do um, Trojan DAO. And <clears throat> it was part of the DAO incubator. Um, and uh, and and that's the way they try to like raise money uh, to fund projects. And I don't know exactly how many projects they funded so far, but um, I think there was one for sure. Um, and yeah, and uh, but they're, they're trying. You know, it's like one of the first ones. So uh, it's also on all sides. It's a new experiment. Like from the um, even from Aragon side, it's a it's a new uh, it's a new thing. So, uh, but yeah, that was going uh, going into the real world. This is exciting. No, I'm going to be the Debbie Dunn. <laughs> uh, no, but it's it's actually really interesting. I think this is kind of opening up for a new for a lot of food for thought of how you can drive uh, art projects in a more sustainable way, I guess. But I know that even DAO or Trojan DAO now, they have problems themselves kind of figuring out where the initial funding is going to come from that they can then drive the projects with. Um, so, yeah, exactly. They don't really know where the source is going to come from or how even to start really to actually raise the funds to be able to drive further projects. Um, but I think there's definitely models who can be... Um, experimented with and, and really maybe help to push people to think about f art, funding art projects in a different way. Yeah, so um, yeah, just a final remark. I think that DAOs are a wonderful tool for coordination, but that's about it. I don't, I don't realistically think that they can replace organizations. I wouldn't like to see, uh, you know, the MoMA uh, replaced by a huge DAO, and maybe, maybe a department of it would be really cool, and for the sake of experimentation, but there's also other ways, like, you know, artists can get together and uh, make a DAO, like the Trojan DAO guys did, or, uh, you know, in the, like, coming back to data as well, there's, like, a lot of creative ways that one can, can get together with other people and generate data markets, uh, I think that uh, it was streamers, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> that introduced the concept of data unions that I, yeah, I'm right? Cool. <laughs> uh, so I think that there's a lot of creative ways and uh, as we experiment with both data, art, uh, and you know anything that the blockchain allows, we, we will get uh, to better places. For more on Data Union, there's a, there's a conference on Friday <laughs> for Radical Exchange. Come to... I know. <laughs> I think it's also one, one small remark, which I think is important to remember, talking about this kind of, this new art economy or any kind of, well, actually just this new art economy is to remember that I don't, I don't necessarily believe that it's going to replace what we currently have, because I think that's, uh, it's, it's there. It's been for a really long time. Um, it it's, might not be functioning, but it is, functioning in some way. Um, so I think it's not actually about replacing it, but developing options that will be able to coexist along, alongside what we currently have. Yeah. I also, I liked what y'all said um, as like as well, because it kind of highlights something that I think is a, like two sources of friction in open source. One, you know, how do you incentivize people to do, you know, the right things to push something forward, you know, things that are useful, things that don't waste more people's time, things that aren't actively malicious, but then also, um, you know, what is the role of curation in open source? Like what is lost when things are open source and decentralized in terms of, you know, sourcing the right th uh, things to bring together, whether that's an art exhibit, whether that's data sets that, you know, have more value together, you know, how do we enable this role of um, playing, you know, a curatory or whatever, a function. Um, so I'd love any thoughts that you'll have on that, because I think as we're creating new economies. Yeah, sure. Uh, for me, the problem with uh, 
The, the common problem with open source is that because there is no sense of ownership and there is also not, like the, the incentive layer is not very well adjusted, then, uh, you know, some things are of lower quality than others. Then, of course, in the, in the software side, that's completely different because people do it for the credit and it's very important and very deeply rooted in the open source community. So that's completely different. But if you, like, if you take it to the art market or something, you have to make sure that you have the right uh, incentives and the right mechanism and it uh, that it goes before you know uh, deciding to open source anything otherwise you're going to get a low quality product because of the education of the people you know they tend to be selfish and th there's no prestige in being open source in this area as well Um, there's actually, I think it's the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam that has their whole uh, collection, open, open, open source data. So basically you can download any image or painting or uh, yeah, photo they have in high quality and create your own thing. So people have been like printing a Rembrandt on toilet paper or, you know, having um, another really old painting on soda, soda cans and things like that and it's actually been super popular and they've they've seen that it's opened up to a much more um like people have been way more excited about actually their collection when they've been able to interact with it in this way rather than just go and see it um, just so one note on the Reich Museum, I think they um, they limit the commercial use. Uh, so it's like if you want to sell your toilet paper, your Rembrandt toilet paper, then it's uh, they're trying to limit it. But again, I mean they're not really. Um, if you're just selling it in your hometown, <laughs> probably fine. Um, just to go back on the curation side, I think. Um, especially because we all see the, uh, the benefit of the decentralization and the peer-to-peer. -peer, um, you know, like. Um, reputation, uh, we um, we all want to get there, right? And and I think yeah, developers have uh, managed to get there with the right incentives and the right inclusion. But uh, the time we we'll get there, we get there in the art market with curation, like and and TCR and 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 this thing. It's like yeah, I want that tomorrow, um, but that's not possible. I mean, curators uh, don't have the same level of uh, knowledge, like technical knowledge. Uh, it's like we'll get there. Uh, but in the meantime, not not everything has to be decentralized, and I think that curation on on that point, I think, should stay, um, uh, especially in 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 the short term. Definitely, and yeah, I really like that point as well because I think it ties back into what um, we were saying at the beginning of the panel about attribution networks and how you can create, you know, creating these systems. You can either you know, create it from the top down and have, you know, this um, game theoretically perfect model of how people behave, or you can try to, um, you know, parameterize and like create metrics for, you know, what actually happens in real life systems and, you know, come up with a way to mathematically express this reputation and kind of observe the dynamics of, you know, how value flows around, you know, through assets, through institutions, through the individuals connecting them. So, you know, that is definitely a uh, hope that I have for, you know, exploring modeling these economies. So, um, yeah. I count on you. <laughs> yes. Well, I am not the right person for that, but the collective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah. So basically, we're now going to have a 10 minutes break and then come back and do a workshop working through a specific use case of kind of prototyping one part of um, the art economy as a data economy. So, <laughs> very cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs>